Okay, so guys, welcome to the long-awaited episode number two of the Fundamental Series. Um, Before we get right back into things here, I've got two very important things that I want to announce, which I think will also help explain why this series was put on the back burner um, for those few months. Um, So I'm sorry about that, uh, but here we are. Um, In any case, the first thing is that my new website, uh, jeffnipper.com, is officially live, so you can Go to the link in the description and go check that out. As of now, I think the best thing that you can do there is just sign up for my mailing list, uh, which I'm going to be sending out uh, new updates about my fundamentals book and the new beginner, intermediate, and advanced training programs that I have coming out uh, in the next month or so. And I'm also going to be eventually firing up my blog over there again, um, so you'll be notified if you get on my mailing list uh, when they go out. And that's just because I find social media and YouTube just aren't reliable to kind of get the information out there anymore uh, at all. Uh, Which brings me to my second uh, most important update, uh, which is the Fundamentals book itself. Uh, It's not ready just yet, and that's actually the reason why this series was so delayed in the first place. I was spending so much time writing this fundamentals book, uh, which I want to capture everything. And then I realized that I decided that I wanted it to be a full-blown, published, printed, actual book. Um, So needless to say, it's taking quite a lot more time than I had initially anticipated for. Um, But anyway, uh, the best way to, again, keep up to date with that is just to get on my mailing list. And um, once that goes up for pre-order, I'll be sure to let you guys all know here right away. Um, But it's looking like that's going to come probably after I release uh, my beginners program, which I plan to launch next month alongside episode three of this series. Um, And then I plan to launch a push-pull legs program for more intermediate level lifters. Um, That'll complement my Science Applied series. Uh, And then I'm also going to eventually launch uh, a power building program as well, uh, which will be based off of my current training and how that's all going. Um, So anyways, uh, without further ado, guys, uh, I hope you guys all enjoy episode number two of the Fundamental series. All right, what is going on, everyone? I want to welcome you all to episode number two of the Fundamental series. Since it's been a little while, since uh, episode number one, uh, I figured it'd be a good idea to first do a quick review of everything that we talked about Uh, in the first episode uh, to do with training. If you guys maybe just watched the first one or you feel like you don't need that primer, I'll put a timestamp up right here where you can skip to where I dig into the new stuff. Um, But I think that it is important to have a a fundamental grasp of all of these rungs of the ladder uh, before we start getting into the more complicated stuff uh, up here. Um, So very quickly, uh, here on the bottom rung as sort of the most fundamental thing, we have sustainability. And the reason I rank this so highly, or I guess, so low on the ladder uh, is because this is something that we want to be doing across really a lifetime. It's a little bit cliche, uh, but I think there's a lot of truth to the fact that we want to think of this sort of fitness journey as more of a marathon than a sprint. Um, In order for that to be successful, uh, it has to be a a sustainable approach. So one that you can stick to over the long term. And in order for an approach to be sustainable, um, it has to be safe and it has to be enjoyable. Um, And those sort of form the uprights um, or the two main legs of the rest of the ladder. And and I think it's important to highlight here the principles of what is optimal and what is practical. Um, So what is perhaps most optimal on paper isn't always what is most practical uh, actually in the field. And this is an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, Just because something is theoretically more optimal doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be what will work best for you. Um, So you have to be looking for what is actually going to be practical and allow you to follow through and to execute um, over the long term. So if we go up one rung from sustainability, we have effort. Uh, This basically means that no matter how optimal and how scientifically uh, grounded the rest of uh, your program is, if you're not applying appropriate effort, then you're not going to get the results that you're looking for. And this isn't clearly defined in the scientific literature, uh, but it's probably something around leaving no more than, say, three or four reps in the tank for most of your work. Up next, we've got POP, which stands for Progressive Overload and Prioritization. Uh, So Progressive Overload basically just refers to adding something over time. Um, So usually that comes in the form of adding more weight to the bar or to the machine that you're using, um, or adding reps. Those are both ways to progressively overload. And if I were to say one of these factors is the most important thing for driving muscle hypertrophy, uh, it probably is progressive overload. Um, And then prioritization uh, basically just refers to keeping the goal the goal 
Um, so you want to prioritize the things that you're trying to improve the most, the things that are most important to you. Um, so if you have weak arms, then you want, you'll want to prioritize your arms in your training. Um, if you want to improve your bench press, you'll want to prioritize that, such as by, say, putting it early in the training week when you're fresh or putting it early in the workout um, when you're stronger. Um, and then uh, after all of that stuff, uh, we get up here to the acute training variables, uh, which is what we're going to cover in this video. Um, specifically, we're going to get into volume, so how much work should you do, um, how many sets and reps and so on. Uh, we're going to talk about frequency, so how frequently should you train each body part, uh, how many times per week, and then we're also going to cover some example splits um, that can allow you to hit that volume and frequency in a sort of optimal way. Um, then in part three, uh, I realize it's just going to be too much information to do uh, in just two episodes, so in part three we're going to cover intensity, so how heavy should you train. Uh, we're going to cover rest periods, uh, exercise selection, are some exercises better than others? And then also lifting tempo. Uh, so how fast should you be lifting the weights? That, that's it for the review. Uh, we're going to get into the first part of this, which is going to be volume, next. All right, so the first variable we're going to dive into is training volume. And in the literature, this has been cited as being the main driver of hypertrophy. Uh, I think this is a little bit of a controversial statement still. Um, I would say... Personally, if anything is probably you know, really driving hypertrophy as the main factor, it, it's probably progressive overload. Uh, but as we'll see, progressive overload really does tie in as a concept with uh, the idea of volume and training volume. Um, and they're kind of inextricably linked in a way. Um, so I think that that's a pretty fair statement to make. Um, so volume is something that ranks very, very highly um, in terms of optimizing your uh, growth potential. Um, and in the literature, it's been described as having a dose-response relationship. Uh, so basically, as you increase training volume, uh, there's a straightforward increase in muscle hypertrophy that you see as a result. Before we uh, get into that, um, first, I think it's important to define what exactly it is uh, that volume is. And basically, we're just using it to refer to the total amount of work uh, that you do in your training. Um, so in the literature, this is sometimes approximated as the number of sets times the number of reps times the load, uh, which is basically just the weight that you're using. Um, so as you can see from the formula, there are basically three main ways that you can increase uh, the volume that you're doing. Um, so you can increase the number of sets, you can increase the number of reps, and you can increase the weight. Now you'll remember from the progressive overload section or the progressive overload rung uh, that when we're aiming for progressive overload, we're already trying to increase the load from workout to workout, or I should say, and or increase uh, the number of reps that you're doing. So you're trying to add a rep, add some weight, um, and that's how you achieve progressive overload. Um, so assuming that you're already trying to incrementally increase these, uh, I think the real thing that we need to look at when we're looking at volume is how many sets you're doing. This is really gonna be a major determinant of what your total volume ends up being for you. Um, so from a practical perspective, I think it makes most sense to track your number of working sets. Um, so people who've written about this more than I uh, have called this uh, tough sets. So your number of tough sets is a pretty good proxy uh, for your training volume. Um, so this would basically exclude any warm-up sets that you're doing, um, and it would require that your sets are taken to something around... Uh, you know, something around leaving no more than three or four reps in the tank. Uh, that would classify as a tough set, and that would count towards uh, your training volume. Um, so the question is, how many sets do we want to be doing per body part? There isn't one clear answer on this, and it's going to be highly individual, uh, but I also think it also very much depends on your own training goals. If you're just someone who is, say, looking to, you know, improve their overall shape, get stronger, uh, build some muscle mass, but maybe not do so on a competitive level, um, then the amount of volume that you're probably going to want to do is going to be different than someone who you know, wants to do this on a highly elite competitive level. And so this brings me to this graph over here. Uh, so very quickly, I'll just introduce the, the main concept here. Uh, so on the x-axis, you have uh, training volume. And then on the y-axis, uh, you have gains. Um, so this is gains in hypertrophy. 
And as you can see, uh, initially, the steepness or the slope of the curve here is, is uh, pretty high. Um, so you can get quite a bit of gains initially without having to do uh, too, too much volume. Uh, but then there comes a point somewhere around here that the amount of gains that you get starts to really level off. So you start to get diminishing returns for doing extra volume. And then there seems to be a point where doing even more volume will actually result in a loss of gains. Um, so this is what you'd call you know, overtraining or overreaching. Um, you're doing more volume than your body can recover from, and so you start to lose some of those adaptations that you had initially gained. So I'm going to switch over here. This point right here, we tend to call minimum effective dose or minimum effective volume. And it's a bit of a hairy concept. Uh, it's not easy to pin it down just to one point because you could say, well, the minimum effective volume is technically somewhere way down here where you get you know, some gains for a little bit of volume. Uh, but I like to think of this as the minimum amount of volume to get, to get you the gains that you want. Um, and more practically, I think it, it, it's, you want to think about it as that point where the gains start to become diminishing. Uh, so as you start to do more volume, you don't actually see much more of an increase in hypertrophy. And I think that as a beginner, this is where most people want to be. Um, now I'll introduce another concept. So this point right here, where you actually begin to see it go the other direction, is what we'll call MRV, so maximum recoverable volume. So this is the amount of volume that you can, or this is the maximum amount of volume that you can do and still recover from. Um, so it's sort of somewhere just before you start to get to that overtraining area over here. Um, for people who are more, you know, looking to do this on the elite level, you may want to flirt with this MRV boundary a little bit more. And it might simply just be worth it to you to do all of this extra volume to get those extra little bit of gains for you know, people who maybe aren't wanting, <laughs> wanting to do it quite on that level, uh, I think minimum effective dose is fine. And I think that you could make the argument that over an entire training career, perhaps just accumulating these minimum effective volume workouts uh, over enough time will lead you to reach your sort of natural genetic limit anyway. And so this could be potentially a good approach really for anyone. Um, however, that's something that uh, I think experts in the field will argue about, and I think it's best to just kind of leave it up to you to decide what sort of volume makes most sense for you and your goals. To make this a little bit more tangible, um, we're going to put some numbers on this. Uh, so usually for most people, uh, especially beginners, 10 sets tends to be somewhere around this point here, uh, past which you start to see diminishing returns. Um, and then this point here is somewhere around 20 sets. And that's sets per body part per week. Quick example, let's take the chest. Uh, if you do 10 sets per week uh, for the chest, you'll be doing pretty well, you know, maxing out most of your hypertrophic potential. Uh, if you were to bump that up to 20 sets per week for the chest, uh, you would pretty much be maxing it out fully. Uh, then once you start to get up here in maybe the 30 sets per week zone, uh, you're definitely uh, flirting with overtraining territory at that point, and it may actually be detrimental to your progress. Of course, that's going to be highly individual. I know some people who are freaks and can handle a ton of volume, uh, but generally, for the most part, most people are going to want to be somewhere in this range. So again, depending on your goals and you know, your athletic background and your level of advancement, uh, you're going to want to be somewhere in between 10 sets per body part per week and 20 sets uh, per body part per week. Um, when I say 10 sets per body part, uh, I'm referring to these big body parts over here. Um, so for the chest, the back, uh, the quads, and the glutes, there will be some crossover between the quads and the glutes. Uh, so if you're doing, say, squats, for example, you'd probably want to count that as a set for both. But still, uh, you want to be somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, and then for hams and also for the abs and the calves, uh, you can probably get away with a little less here. Um, but they are weak points for a lot of people. So I figured um, I'd be generous and give them the same 10-set uh, requirement. Um, and then for these smaller muscle groups, so say the triceps, biceps, rear delts, and side delts, they're going to get a lot of crossover work from these bigger muscles over here. Uh, so let's say you're doing bench press for the chest. Uh, the triceps are going to be getting a lot of indirect work. 
Um, but yet still, <clears throat> probably not quite enough uh, to really optimize their growth uh, just from those compound lifts alone. And the same thing goes for biceps. You will get a lot of biceps work uh, by doing, you know, lat pull downs and rows, uh, so your standard back movements. Um, but still, I think that to optimize these muscle groups, uh, you will want to do some isolation work. Um, so over here, I would say that you don't need to do, you know, 10 sets for triceps and 10 sets for biceps on top of the 10 sets that you're doing over here. Uh, I would say an extra four, an extra four to eight isolation sets for these uh, will be sufficient. And then for front delts, you actually don't need any extra work. Uh, because anything that you're doing over here for the chest and the shoulders uh, will hit the front delts just fine. And so there's no real need, I think, in any case to add uh, things like front raises. Um, so at the end of all this, in, in terms of assessing your own program, uh, which we will get to when we talk about training frequency and training splits, the question you want to be asking yourself is, are you getting stronger? If you are getting stronger, that's a sign that you're progressing, you're building new muscle, and everything is good. Uh, there's no real need to switch things up or to add you know, more work. Uh, if it's working, keep going with it until it stops working. If it stops working and you notice that you know, your strength isn't increasing, uh, you don't seem to be adding any new muscle mass visually, uh, that may be a sign that you need to add more work. And so you may want to start increasing the number of sets that you're doing um, so you can start to get some more of these uh, incremental or I should say marginal gains. Um, but still, I think that most people for say their first year uh, at least of training um, shouldn't really need to do that too much uh, as long as you're just focusing on general progressive overload uh, you should be able to progress just fine uh, without having to worry about increasing your sets from that sort of standard 10 sets per week uh, for a while uh, but again that's going to be uh, very highly individual and then also i'd like to just remind you guys that uh, all of this is within or said within the context of uh, applying appropriate effort. Um, so again, it doesn't really matter what you're doing up here uh, if you're not applying the appropriate effort uh, from the outset. Ho hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, that's pretty much uh, everything I think you need to know as a beginner about volume and training volume and kind of where you need to be in terms of uh, how many sets uh, you should be doing per week. Um, and I think that this is gonna make a little bit more sense uh, once we start to dig into training frequency, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, so we've established that 10 sets per week is a pretty good general ballpark figure uh, of where we want to be in terms of training volume. Um, so now the question is, how do we split that up uh, and turn it into an actual training program? Um, so I think that in the end, ultimately, <laughs> what the literature boils down to on this is that two times a week frequencies, so that's two times per week per body part, uh, tend to be better than hitting every body part only one time per week. Uh, and whether or not frequencies of three times per week or more than that uh, are better, uh, I think remains to be seen. Um, and this is assuming that volume is matched. Um, so even when we're doing the same volume, so just for example, say we're doing 10 sets per week here uh, per body part and 10 sets per week here, uh, we still tend to see better hypertrophy in the two times per week group. And there are a couple proposed mechanisms for this. Uh, the main one, I think, is that you tend to get, or you do get, uh, an extra spike in muscle protein synthesis. Um, so when you resistance train, uh, you sort of sensitize the muscle to amino acid uptake, um, which over enough time sort of compounds into more hypertrophy. Um, and I did a whole interview with an actual muscle protein synthesis researcher uh, on this topic, so I'll link that up there in the cards if you'd like a little more detail on that. Um, but that's ultimately what it boils down to. And then you can also make the practical case that if you're training each body part twice a week, uh, it's actually a little easier to get your weekly volume in um, and maybe to push a slightly higher weekly training volume. Um, so if you're trying to cram all your chest volume, let's say, uh, just in one session per week, um, that session will either get long to the point where it's tough to get all the sets in, or it'll give you a reduced ability to exert yourself on those later sets in the workout. Um, so by the time you get to, let's say, your 10th set, or if you're more advanced, your 20th set of chest in a single workout, um, there's almost no way that you can exert yourself in the same way. Um, so from a practical perspective, volumes tend not to be matched between these two, and it tends to be easier to use higher volumes with the two times per week frequency. Which I think is a pretty good argument uh, in its favor. 
Um, but we're going to get to that once we get to uh, some actual examples. Um, so I think it's a little bit confusing for some people in my experience to hear, OK, I have to do 10 sets per week. And you try to think of how to conceptualize that in a training program. Um, so what I've done is I've laid out five different examples of ways that you can set it up. And we'll just go through these uh, using the back as an example. OK, so we're going to use the back as an example. And we're going to try to squeeze in 10 sets per week in each one of these splits and then kind of compare them in turn. Uh, so in split number one, we've got the standard upper lower split, uh, which is actually what I recommend uh, most for beginners um, and maybe even you know, early intermediates. And this is actually the split that I'm doing myself right now. Uh, so I think that this is a very good one. And if any of them are going to take the cake, in my eyes, it will probably be this one. Um, and so if we just you know, go through quickly with an example, I'm going to get rid of that circle I just drew. So with the back, uh, you do it on both of your upper body days. So you'd hit your back here, and you'd hit your back here, along with, obviously, the rest of your upper body. And you'd want to be doing 10 sets per week, so you'd split it up to do five sets here and five sets here. And the way I'd actually recommend doing this in practice is through a little bit of exercise variation. Um, so of these five sets, you would do, let's say, three sets of a pull-up. So three sets of, say, a wide grip pull-up. And then you do two sets of, let's say, a dumbbell row. Um, so you've got a vertical movement, and then you've got a horizontal movement. Uh, three and two gives you your five sets for that day. Uh, and then down here, you'd switch them around. So you'd do, say, three sets of, let's say, a barbell row. So you'd start with your horizontal pull. Uh, and then you do two sets of your vertical pull. And let's say we switch it up and we go with, uh, oops. So we switch it up and we go with a, a lat pull down here. Um, then you add all these numbers up and you get your 10 sets per week. And it's distributed across two workouts. And then, of course, you'd do the same thing for your lower body, uh, 10 sets for every body part, uh, split up, something like that. And that would be your, your program. And part of the reason why I like this so much for beginners is that it has you in the gym four days per week, which I think is pretty manageable for most people. And you have plenty of rest between sessions. Um, so you have three rest days to allow you to sort of recover not only the muscle groups that you're training directly in that session, uh, but just your body more globally, I guess. The sample split number two is a simple full body split. Um, so you just hit full body twice per week with plenty of rest in between. And I do like this split, not quite as much as the upper lower one, though, because in order to cram 10 sets of every body part uh, of your whole body, uh, these workouts are going to have to be fairly long. They're at least going to have to be quite a bit longer than these workouts, uh, these upper and lower workouts over here. Um, but the advantage is that you only have to be in the gym twice per week, and you will get this, I mean, if not the same, very similar results between these two programs. And if you're someone who doesn't maybe like to go to the gym quite as frequently, this is probably the one to go with. Um, I also like it for beginners because you do have a ton of rest in between uh, workouts. So I wouldn't say you're too likely to run into any recovery issues here. Um, the only potential issue is that I think the workouts will get quite a, quite a bit long. Um, but again, you'd split it up. Uh, so you'd do, just running with the back as an example, you'd do five sets uh, on this first full body workout and then another five on your second full body workout. Um, so a variation on this that I actually like better um, is number three here. Um, so with this one, you're also doing full body uh, every day you're in the gym, um, but you split it up into three workouts. Um, so now, instead of having a two times per week frequency per body part, uh, you have a three times per week frequency for each body part. And we don't know if that's necessarily better, uh, but what it does allow is it allows these workouts to be a little bit shorter. Um, so instead of doing you know, five sets uh, for every uh, muscle group each workout, you might want to only do four here, uh, and then three here, and three here. And so that would still be a total of 10. Um, so using the back as an example, you may want to do four sets of pull-ups, uh, do a, a row here, so let's say three sets of a barbell row, and then here you may want to do a row again, so three sets of uh, a cable row or maybe a face pull. 
and that would basically be how you'd set it up. Um, the only potential downside that I would see uh, with this one is that it may not feel like you're getting much of a workout. Um, so for example, if you just go in and do just three sets of barbell row and that's your whole back workout for that day, uh, it may not feel like you know, you're getting much of a pump or you, it may take you a while to kind of get into your groove. Um, but with that said, uh, I still think that this is a very good program for beginners, uh, especially um, as you're, you know, you don't quite have the same recovery capacity, and so only having smaller volume workouts uh, may be actually to your advantage here. And similar to here, you have you know, tons of rest in between these workouts. Okay, so the fourth split is the classic bro split. And this is what, in my experience, most people in the gym are doing. Um, this is what I started doing, uh, and it's what I think most bodybuilders do uh, even today. Uh, and you'll start basically uh, day one with chest, uh, day two you do back, day three legs, uh, shoulders, and then arms and abs, and then you rest on the weekends. And there are a bunch of different ways you can set that up, but that's just one common way that I've seen it done. And uh, the bro split gets a, a lot of hate online um, for being you know, suboptimal from a muscle protein synthetic perspective uh, and so on. Uh, but I actually don't think it's that bad. Uh, I don't think it's the best, and I don't think it's probably as good as these. Um, however, if it is a program that you know allows you to get in the gym and you enjoy it and it allows you to follow through, uh, then I see really no major problem with it. Um, and you can certainly you know match volume doing this program and see very similar results to what you would see over here, uh, provided all this other stuff that we've talked about is in place. Um, with that said, I do see a few drawbacks with the bro split. Um, first of all, you're only getting a one time per week frequency for every body part, technically speaking, and we do know that two times per week is marginally better uh, from a hypertrophic perspective and from a strength perspective. Um, however, uh, I think that you could make the case that, well, if you're hitting chest here and then you're hitting shoulders here, I mean, since there's going to be a lot of crossover, you're technically getting a little bit of a shoulder workout, probably on your chest day. And let's say on your arm day, uh, you're you know, doing biceps, but your biceps are also getting quite a bit of indirect work on your back day. Um, so you could make the case that you know, this actually is, a, I guess, in reality, higher training frequency than it looks like uh, on paper. And that's a point that I've made in the past, and I think it is fairly valid. Um, but there are still a couple other problems uh, with the bro split. Uh, the first is that I think you know, you're just taking a little bit too long between training stimuli. Um, of course, this isn't as big of a deal if you buy the sort of overlapping theory. Um, but still, I think that there is a case to be made for having more frequent blips in muscle protein synthesis. And with this, you've just got so long uh, from one workout to the next. So let's just take the legs as one example. You've got six days that are going to go by before you hit your legs again. And I don't think anyone really needs quite that much recovery unless you're absolutely blasting your legs, um, which just isn't really necessary. You don't need to cram that much volume in one workout. And so I think that this is sort of like a waste of recovery in a way. You'd probably be better off splitting this volume up into two workouts and only having a couple days of recovery in between. Then you can take advantage of that muscle protein synthetic effect and also sort of spread out your volume a little bit better. And this leads me to the point of wasted sets. Um, there's a pretty well-established idea that just like you can only do so much volume in a training week and you start to see a drop off or you start to see at least a, a very solid plateau, um, that can also apply to a single workout where if you start to do, you know, upwards of, we don't know what the exact number is, but let's just say 20 sets in a single workout, um, everything that you do above that is wasted. Um, so I would say for a beginner, or I should say more or less wasted. Um, so for a beginner, maybe doing something you know, over this 10 sets or maybe even over six or seven sets in a single workout, those later sets aren't contributing to the hypertrophic process in the same way that the earlier sets are. Um, so I think that's a pretty good case for splitting it up a little bit better. Um, but with that said, I think we're, again, teasing out those differences between optimal and practical. And if this is a practical routine that you enjoy and you'll follow through on and you're continuing to get stronger and you're progressing and you're consistent with it, then I absolutely think that this is a feasible routine 
to give a go. Finally, it brings me to the push-pull leg split, um, which is another favorite of mine. Uh, however, I do see this as more of an intermediate to advanced program uh, just because you are in the gym six days a week, which I think is quite a lot for a beginner. And we need to consider not only rest between each body part, uh, but also just rest in general for your body. Um, and I like to have more rest days uh, for a hardcore beginner than um, just one per week. Um, but still, uh, this is a, a very effective program. And like the rest of them, you do have uh, each muscle being hit twice per week, um, which I think is, is the best way to set it up. Um, so out of these five, uh, you can probably get a decently clear idea of how to fit 10 sets per week uh, per body part into your overall training program. And for this one, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I uh, hope you guys found it to be helpful. Um, in the next episode, we're going to cover uh, intensity. So how heavy should you go? Um, should you use uh, high reps or low reps? Uh, we're going to cover rest periods, tempo, and also exercises. So what exercises should you be selecting in your program? But for now, I'm going to wrap that one up here. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, please share this with your friends. Uh, leave me a like if you liked it. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.